Welcome back to Stanford SS 2 for W. Um, today we are going to um, re uh, continue our discussion on machine learning with graphs. And in particular, we will be visiting a new family of solutions that can uh, do classifications on graphs. So earlier we have been focusing on the paradigm of um, graph neural networks. And today we will be with another different idea but share a lot of similar intuitions that is called labor propagation. And uh, labor propagation has a very long history. It is uh, like uh, invented way before graph neural networks. Um, and it has a, a lot of application beyond uh, graph as well, like uh, in the so. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, besides like uh, making predictions on graphs, people have used it in semi supervised learning and a lot, a lot of other applications as well. So this will be the topic uh, for today. So here's the uh, outline for today's lecture. Um, the main question we want to ask is, uh, given a network uh, with uh, certain labels on some of the nodes, um, how do we assign the labels to the rest of, uh, rest of the nodes? Um, and for example, uh, suppose there's a social network. We know some of the nodes are uh, fraudsters, um, and some others are fully trusted. And how do you uh, find the, uh, like the remaining fraud, fraud nodes and the remaining trustworthy nodes? Um, and as you know, this setting will have been investigated through the idea of embedding-based methods. And these node embeddings can either be generated from random walks, uh, like uh, node to walk, deep walk, that we have introduced a few lectures back, or we can generate a node embedding using a graph neural networks based on the idea of neighborhood aggregation. And we have seen graph neural networks in the past um, five uh, different lectures. Um, and the uh, key question we want to ask today is that are there alternative ways to uh, still make these predictions on networks based on what we know and predict the unknown node labels. So um, here's our setting. Suppose we are given a graph um, and we know some of the nodes and usually very few set of the nodes um, uh, labels and we want to predict the labels of the remaining nodes in the network. Um, let's say we have these two classes, uh, green and red, and then we want to uh, make predictions all for all the remaining gray nodes. Um, and uh, the term terminology to describe this classification is transductive node classification that we have introduced uh, two lectures back. Um, the reason they call it transductive is because all the training and validation data um, they are all on the same network, so we only focus on one network. We don't need to generalize it to a separate network. And then we know some of the nodes label and we want to predict remaining ones. So that's why I call it transductive node classification. And another uh, name for this setting is so-called se semi-supervised node classification. Um, and this is kind of a legacy name to describe the setting of this uh, problem. Um, the motivation is that um, usually the network is huge and we only know very few labels of the nodes. So uh, it's a kind of not, not a supervised learning task where we have a lot of labels, but not like an unsupervised learning task where we have no labels at all. So uh, kind of an intermediate state. So people sometimes also call it semi-supervised node classification. So this uh, will be a setting we want to uh, discuss today. Um, and today we're going to solve this problem using a different uh, like a methodology as uh, we have motivated called label propagation. Um, and the main assumption or the main intuition here is that correlations widely exist in networks. Um, and uh, to be more specific, what we mean is that we assume uh, nodes that are connected tend to share the same labels. Um, and this uh, effect, as we will dive uh, deeper later, actually widely exists in a lot of rural networks. So uh, this is a kind of a um, uh, like a general assumption you can always make um, for real world graphs. Um, and to solve this problem based on this intuition, we will specifically introduce three different techniques. Um, the first uh, is the basics um, of uh, this idea. It's called label propagation. Um, and uh, this topic is also quite important and you probably encounter it in this homework too as well, how to uh, use label propagation to solve a specific prediction problem. Uh, another uh, technique we call uh, is um, correct and smooth. And this is actually the current state of our methods uh, when we make predictions on networks. And it's dominating a lot of benchmarks. 
And uh, the nice of this approach is that it can really combine labor propagation and graph neural networks that we learned earlier. So um, it can uh, actually like, uh, utilize the idea from both sides. And lastly, we're going to talk about the approach called mask uh, labor prediction. Um, and this is a new content we add for this year's offering. Um, and the main motivation that this solution is super simple to implement, and it may be useful for your course project uh, if needed. Um, so uh, let's get started with the motivation, like why we want to um, like uh, assign uh, similar labels to nodes that are connect connected. And this is based on the observation that correlation uh, widely exists in network. Um, and we found that uh, behaviors uh, of nodes are connected across uh, the links of the network. Um, for example, uh, usually uh, the nodes that are labeled sharing the same label, they tend to cluster together, like a green, there's a green cluster and the red cluster. And there are some very good reasons that why this assumption will hold true, especially in uh, real world networks. Um, and there are two terminologies here. One is called homophily, the second called uh, influence. And these two like observations from social science or network science can give a lot of nice intuition that why um, this like correlation widely exists in networks. Uh, in particular, for homophily, we want to argue that there are certain individual characteristics of different nodes that le uh, leads to the social connections between these nodes. And vice versa, uh, in terms of influence, because nodes are closely uh, tied together through their social connections, in the end, they tend to share uh, very similar individual characteristics. So these are the two uh, motivations we have. And uh, let's uh, dive deeper into the two effects. First, regarding homophily. Um, homophily really means that the tendency of individuals in a network tend to uh, bond or associate together with uh, their uh, neighbors. Uh, and it has been observed that a vast array of network studies um, kind of have these homophily attributes. For example, um, the age, gender, organization roles of nodes usually uh, cluster together if they have similar uh, values. Um, some uh, concrete example, including on an academic, uh, academic network, researchers who focus on the same research area uh, tend to um, establish closer connections uh, compared to researchers that does not belong to the same area. This is because they can like uh, cite each other's papers, they may meet at different conferences, etc. And this kind of uh, motivated why those uh, individual characteristics um, kind of uh, establish those social connections between different nodes. Um, and this homophily is uh, widely uh, existed um, in social networks. And here's an, like a, a concrete example visualization of social networks. And this network is built upon uh, different people and based on their friendship relationship. Uh, the colors means the interest of different people. Like some people may interest in sports, uh, some interest in arts, etc. So given this real world uh, large networks, we can label each node based on their interest. And we can easily see from this visualization that um, the color of nodes tends to cluster together, meaning that uh, nodes that share uh, similar labels, they are closely connected as well. So that's uh, kind of a concrete example how homophily uh, appears in real world networks. Um, another um, motivation we have is this uh, notion called influence. Uh, and uh, inf influence says that the social connections can influence uh, individuals' characteristics. Um, for example, uh, suppose a group of people are uh, often uh, like a, uh, connect together and they may share their interests and influence each other. Let's say if I have interest uh, in certain musical uh, preferences, then um, that may grow the interest of my peers uh, who are connected with me as well. So this is kind of what uh, influence is happening in real world. Um, and consequently, because this influence exists, suppose nodes are, that are closely connected together, in the end, they may tend to share similar features and eventually similar labels. So that's another way to understand why this homophily and influence uh, tend to like, uh, appear in the network. So, so far we have seen some nice motivations from network science why uh, there are a lot of correlations exist in networks. 
So the question is, how do we leverage this observation and transform uh, into machine learning solutions and that can apply on the semi-supervised uh, classification that we care about uh, in the networks? Um, so to show this, um, we're going to use concrete example to set up the problem setting. Um, suppose we have this network with a lot of nodes and some of the nodes are labeled. Um, for example, this green nodes are uh, like a label as one, the red nodes are labeled as uh, zero. And our goal is that how we want to predict the labels for the remaining nodes in gray. Um, so formally, we're uh, always giving one particular graph and only a very few of the nodes are labeled. And our goal is to find the class, uh, which is the color um, as uh, in our example of the, all the remaining nodes. And our main assumption is that there's homophily in the networks, meaning that suppose nodes are uh, close together, they tend to share similar uh, labels. So um, um, to be more concrete, uh, we have this uh, A as the adjacent matrix, um, and Y to be a vector of labels for each of the nodes. Um, we consider this binary classification, so node only take zero or one. So uh, Y V equals one means that uh, node V has class one, and uh, equals zero means it belongs to class zero. And there are unlabeled nodes that we wish to classify. Our goal is to predict uh, which of uh, these unlabeled nodes are likely to be class one or class uh, zero. So we want to assign a probabilistic vector for each of the unlabeled nodes. Um, so this probabilistic vector can be written as this P over uh, YV. And this is uh, like a generated eventually based on all the features and the uh, known labels for the network. So we want to leverage everything we know from the network and generate this uh, PYV for each of the gray nodes that does not have any labels. So this is um, our setting. Um, and we will focus on this problem through uh, three different approaches that we uh, just talked about. Uh, we will first visit the core idea of label propagation and then talk about how label propagation can be combined with graph neural network which leads to the second solution, correct and smooth. And lastly, we'll talk about a very practical and uh, easy to implement approach called mask label prediction. So this is our approach to solve this problem setting. So we will first talk about label propagation as the uh, first uh, like a foundational uh, like a method in this area. Um, our idea is that we can propagate the node label uh, across the network. So from the nodes that we know the ground truth label to the unknown, uh, uh, unknown nodes. And um, our intuition that the class probability um, of a given node V should be a weighted average of the probabilities of its neighbors. Um, so concretely for a given node uh, uh, like a V, uh, we'll initialize the uh, label of it based on the ground truth label we have. Um, and for those nodes, we do not have any information so they are unlabeled. We will just initialize using a, a value of 0 0.5. Um, and we will update all the unlabeled nodes uh, until the convergence. And this update can happen either in parallel, so we compute um, the updated probabilistic vector for all the nodes, or we can also uh, do uh, like a random update. So pick some random uh, unlabeled nodes to update uh, in a certain iteration um, and until uh, it converged or until the maximum number of iterations is reached. So this is the intuition of labor propagation and we're going to uh, like a, introduce the concrete mathematical form for this algorithm. So um, here is the um, math for labor propagation. Uh, we have this update function that, uh, like that describes one specific iteration of labor propagation the input of this iteration will be the probabilistic vector um, for each of the nodes in a certain time point uh, t. So this uh, pt over uh, yu equals c. So this is um, a two-dimensional vector. Tells us the probability of either a node takes a value of one or it takes a value of zero. We'll uh, time this probabilistic vector with the adjacency matrix uh, and take a summation. So this basically says that I will sum the um, probability vector of all my neighbors. 
And then we'll uh, do a normalization term. So we'll divide the summed value with the, um, the summation of all the neighbors, which is a degree of a given node. So uh, basically what it's saying here is that to compute the next iteration value of a given node, we'll simply take the average of its neighbor's probability vector. So um, it's kind of pretty simple intuition here. Um, and you may recall that this formulation is very similar to a mean aggregation inside a graph neural network, except that now we are not really like learning any embedding or this is not even like a machine learning algorithm. We do not learn anything. We just use this algorithm to iteratively update the labels. So there's no trainable parameters here. And um, our uh, like extension here that suppose we have some strands or weight information on the adjacency matrix. So uh, in this case, the adjacency matrix is no longer binary. Uh, some of the edges have higher weights, some of the edges have lower weights. Then we can easily replace this um, A, U, V, U from the, uh, 0, 1 to the uh, weights of the edges. Um, and we will repeat this uh, update uh, until uh, like, uh, the final value or probability vector converge to uh, within certain threshold. So this is like uh, uh, the uh, exact algorithm of how uh, later perfection works. So it is best to understand this algorithm through a concrete example. So we'll have a running example that describe how um, this labor function works um, in reality. So given these networks, we have some of the nodes labeled as a green or as red. So for nodes that are, are labeled as green, we set them to one. For nodes that are labeled zero, we uh, label as red, uh, we label as zero. And for, for all the remaining gray nodes, we'll initialize them with uh, 0 0.5. Um, so this notation, uh, like a P, Y, I, means that this given node uh, is probability of uh, equal to one. And because it's a binary classification, uh, like the uh, like a probability of taking uh, of it being zero is always one minus uh, like uh, this value. So instead of treating this as a vector, we just uh, treat it as a scalar. Um, and but like this idea can generalize to multi-class classification as well. So this is our initial state. Like uh, suppose we just give a network, uh, provided with a network, then we'll initialize all the nodes uh, with these initial values. So now we'll begin our uh, iteration with um, label propagation. So uh, let's say we want to update the probability vector um, for a given node three. Um, based on the algorithm described, what we do is that we simply uh, average the uh, likelihood of each of the neighbor. So um, in this case, this uh, node three has three neighbors, uh, which uh, has probability of 0 0.5, 0, and 0. So based on these three neighbors, uh, probability value will take an average and assign the new value to this uh, node. And you can see that after this update, like the information that we learned from a given unlabeled node kind of has changed because uh, we observed that it has two neighbors that are labeled as zero. So its likelihood is now lowered uh, because of its neighboring, uh, like a uh, neighboring node's probability value. Um, so similarly, we can update um, the remaining nodes uh, like a, in the network. For example, for this node four, we we'll also look at these four neighbors, and um, like some of them are uh, like 0 0.5, some of them are one, and then we will take the average of its neighbor's probability value, um, and this way uh, we can get the updated value for node uh, four, which is uh, still 0 0.5. So um, like uh, our intuition or the algorithm's guess for the label of uh, node four does not change after this uh, label propagation. Uh, question? Could it be faster if, instead of using the value from the previous iteration, you used whatever the current value was? Mm -hmm. Good point. Um, so um, in our case here, we just uh, like a derive the computation for each of the nodes. The benefit of uh, always using uh, like the first layer is that you can uh, parallelize the computation. So instead of computing in reality, 
instead of computing one node at a time, you can compute like a, the update value for all the nodes in parallel. Um, and uh, in the meantime, I think the algorithm you suggested uh, also makes sense. Um, so the suggestion algorithm that like uh, we just ignore like a uh, like a uh, the so-called previous state of a given node. So we always update based on uh, the current value. Um, I think that is also like a valid algorithm and um, also aligns with our intuition of homophily. Um, but like this is um, like a uh, not really the uh, algorithm we introduce here. I think both algorithms are valid. Okay, so. Um, so this is like our uh, running example regarding computing two nodes in the network. So uh, using the same idea, we can uh, continue to compute all of the unlabeled nodes in the network. Say for node five, uh, we can compute its likelihood to be 0 0.75. Um, and after this iteration, now we have the updated value for each of the unlabeled nodes in the network. And you see that just after this one like a iteration of update, the value already start to make some sense, right? So, um, so in this case, like uh, the nodes eight and nine, they have pretty high, uh, like a predictive value, because they are very close to the label nodes. Um, and for this node, like a three, as we talk about, it has a pretty low prediction score. So, just after one iteration, um, we already like uh, start to make some reasonable guess on the the label uh, on the network. So next, we're going to repeat this computation for each of the unlabeled nodes, uh, and we'll repeat until the value uh, like a stop to change. So um, the convergence criteria, we can um, like a define the convergence criteria based on um, like when the change of uh, the probability uh, value uh, it start to be a, a like smaller than the given epsilon, which is a very small threshold. Then we can call that the algorithm has converged and will stop um, like the update. So uh, we'll uh, like a continue this uh, iteration until we find that in this iteration three and four, you see the value uh, barely changed, and we can in this case we set the epsilon to be zero point zero one. And because we have satisfied the convergence criteria, then we will stop uh, the algorithm and we'll output the prediction based on the final uh, predictive values that we have. So now we can label all the like, unlabeled nodes as converged and we can output our prediction based on the final iteration score. So you see that this algorithm is actually pretty simple. It does not involve any trainable parameter, um, like it's not really a machine learning, it's just a, like an algorithm that can operate on an input graph. Um, but in the end, it is kind of very efficient to compute and also uh, tend to be useful, suppose this homophily assumption holds true uh, in a given network. So there are a lot of real world application of this algorithm because it is uh, very simple and efficient to compute. Um, for example, people have used it for document classification, um, where the nodes are documents and then uh, the edges are the like a similarity between document. For example, there are uh, overlap of the words or sentences in the document. And people have uh, also used on social networks, for example, uh, like a Twitter uh, social networks. The nodes could be different users, tweets, words, etc. Um, the edges um, could be like a user user edges where uh, users follow each other or uh, user tweets uh, edges that tells us some user create uh, some uh, specific tweets. Um, and we can construct an edge between the tweets and the words uh, or hashtags, etc. And on this uh, like a network, suppose we uh, continue to update the network based on the uh, label propagation algorithm. Um, in the end, we'll be able to classify which uh, nodes are more popular or have certain interests, um, like a tour some hashtag, etc. So um, this is kind of another good use case of labor propagation. Um, and people have also used it to do spam or fraud detection. Uh, and for example, on uh, financial networks to, to f or on email networks to identify uh, what are the accounts that are kind of fraudulent. So this is the like a basic idea of um, label propagation, and it has been used in a lot of real-world applications.
Um, question? Yeah, um, I remember on the homework when you were doing the over smoothing thing, mm -hmm. um, kind of showed that it, it only converged if there were certain properties of the graph that weren't there, like it, it, it was by, or it had no bipartite components. Yeah. So is it the same thing with this, or will the algorithm converge for any graph? Yeah, uh, great point. Next. Yeah, using the algorithm just described, it also suffers from the uh, like a non-convergence issue. So, so it's not always the case that this algorithm can converge. So uh, in that case, uh, we can also um, do some mitigation. For example, randomly like a uh, jump the uh, like a uh, shuffle or like add some random noise to the like a uh, node value, so similar to what we see in the uh, homework. But indeed, that is kind of one limitation of the algorithm. Um, and actually, we'll summarize in this slide as well. So. This idea is uh, pretty nice um, and easy to implement, but it suffers from some issues. Um, like uh, one thing we just talked about is that indeed this algorithm does not guarantee to converge on any networks. Um, and also, like even though it may converge, it would, could take a like a lot of steps to converge. So in reality, like on, on reasonable size network, usually people have to like repeat hundreds or even thousands of iterations until a, satisfy, a satisfying uh, like a label value uh, is reached. Um, and another major limitation of uh, label propagation is that uh, it does not utilize any node attributes. So we only propagate the uh, label uh, of the network uh, across the, uh, from the like, a known nodes to the unknown nodes. But we never really utilize any features or attributes in the network. So this is another limitation. So uh, based on these issues, uh, our question next is that can we improve this idea of label propagation so that we can leverage the very useful feature information um, that presented in the network. So this leads to the second approach uh, we want to introduce today uh, that is uh, correct and smooth. So it really um, combines the idea of label propagation and the idea of machine learning uh, with uh, predictions on networks. Um, so the approach of uh, correct and smooth really achieved a lot of uh, real-world success uh, over the past uh, two years. Um, so here is uh, like a screenshot uh, we take a, a few days back on this uh, OGB leaderboard, leaderboard. So OGB is a, a so-called open graph benchmark. Uh, it's a, uh, the, uh, like a, the b uh, largest benchmark data set uh, for graph machine learning. And, uh, there are like hundreds of different submissions from different teams that they are competing with um, tens of different data sets. So uh, you see that uh, correct and smooth or CNS uh, really tops the OJB leaderboard. So a lot of solutions, they have this component of correct and smooth um, in their uh, final submission. And this approach is kind of introduced um, two years back. So it has been like a dominant the leaderboard for a long time. So that kind of gives some real motivation that this approach is indeed very like a, uh, like a uh, very performing perform pretty well in reality. So um, here is the uh, motivation for uh, crack and smooth. Uh, we have learned these two approach. Uh, one is regarding label propagation on networks, uh, and another is uh, for uh, graph neural networks that perform trainable uh, like a neighborhood aggregation on networks. Um, what we'll see is that for this labor propagation, we have assumed that um, suppose node that they are connected, they tend to share similar labels. And this uh, will work because uh, this homophily feature, uh, homophily uh, uh, like a phenomenon kind of widely exists in, in real world social networks. Um, and this approach is pretty easy and fast to compute because um, in the end, what we really need is just some uh, sparse matrix vector multiplication. So it's very fast to compute. Um, but the issue is that uh, the approach does not come with, uh, or does not leverage the feature information in the network. So uh, our motivation to is really leverage such information in the network. Um, on the right-hand side uh, for graph neural network, uh, we made assumption that the label of a given node uh, really depends on its neighborhood structure. So suppose two nodes share the same neighborhood structure, we will get the same embedding for them and then uh, definitely assume that they should share the same label. And it works because uh, in most uh, 
recent real world cases. Uh, the nodes come with very informative features. So uh, by iteratively aggregating the information across a network, we hope that a neural network will be able to learn uh, useful information from the network structure and the features. Um, the like, limitation of GN is that it is definitely slower than label propagation because it has uh, tens of trainable parameter and also uh, the computation can be irre irregular, uh, meaning that it will more challenging to optimize through deep learning framework. Um, so like uh, our motivation is then, can we assume that labels are co correlated and try to simplify the computation uh, like uh, for graph neural network. So based on these two side of uh, like motivation, um, the researchers have uh, proposed uh, this uh, uh, like approach called correct and smooth. Um, question? We said here that label propagation is fast, but earlier we also said that it could be slow to converge, right? So what is the, like, it, it, is it still much faster than this, even though it's potentially slow to converge? And like, how many iterations does it take on a big graph? Yeah, good point. Um, I think this is, uh, this uh, claim that um, the computation is fast is regarding one particular iteration. So one particular iteration is really just a, one matrix vector uh, multiplication where you have the sparse adjacent matrix and some uh, vector, the probability value for each node, yeah. But like, um, because the convergence is not guaranteed, in some cases it's pretty fast, but in other cases it's pretty like, slow. Suppose it does not converge. Um, and, and then regardless how slow it is, uh, like I believe in most cases it's definitely faster than uh, training a deep neural network because in that case you have to uh, apply a lot of stochastic gradient descent steps, so that would be definitely even slower. Yeah, I think for inference, then like because you have a training network, then it's pretty fast. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Okay. So next, we're going to like a like discuss a bit a bit further that why like uh, we have limitations with. A graph, neural net, graph neural network, and how we can use the idea of label propagation to improve the prediction of GNs. So uh, we have seen this figure multiple times across our lectures. Um, uh, the idea of GN is really to encode different nodes based on its different neighborhood structure. And suppose we consider this problem by like, uh, asking how does GN really utilize the label information in the network? Uh, we will find that GN is kind of using the label information very indirectly in the sense that we only use the labels to train um, the ways of a neural network. And then after getting the trained network, we'll make predictions for um, different nodes. And we can find that the predictions for nodes are fully independent or uncorrelated because we'll apply the network for like each of the um, individual nodes without uh, explicitly considering their potential correlations in the network. Um, and in contrast, um, the idea of the uh, label propagation that we just seen, it uses the labels uh, in prediction pretty directly, uh, in like a, by directly propagating the nodes from um, like the nodes with labels to the nodes without labels. So this is kind of a distinct, uh, uh, like a like a important difference between uh, GNN and label propagation. So um, here is a concrete example that. Uh, why uh, this, like making uncorrelated predictions may be uh, problematic. Um, in this setting, uh, we're just given uh, like a very simple graph structure. It is essentially like a sequence. So we have no v1, v2, up to v6 um, that are connected together. It's a line graph or a sequence. Um, the input to a graph neural network will be the local neighborhood structure. So to encode node v1, uh, suppose that the neural network only has one layer uh, to encode node v1, we will look at its one half neighbor v2, uh, and when we encode node v2, we'll look at v1 and v3, etc. So this will be the input to a given uh, graph neural network. And let's examine uh, the predictions and see how the model may learn from the uh, like a ground truth label to make uh, sh such predictions. Um, and our claim is that suppose the node features are overwhelmingly predictive then making such uh, like uncorrelated predictions for each of the nodes may be okay. Um, so uh, what I mean is that those like uh, 
uh, like a, a white and a gray boxes are the node features. And because in this case, the features of different nodes are informative, um, in the end, the neural network will be able to generate different embeddings and therefore make uh, like a predictions that are aligning with the labels of the, uh, in the original network. So the claim is that suppose the features are informative for the uh, prediction task, then this uh, paradigm of uh, GNN, that first computer embedding, and then making the prediction uh, like a, is okay. However, we can um, easily construct some like a failure mode for this uh, particular problem. Uh, let's say we're still giving the same network, but then we're labeling the network with different colors. So uh, in this case, some of the nodes are labeled as uh, uh, red, some of them are labeled as uh, blue. Um, the issue we found here is that GNs will fail to make like a different predictions uh, in this particular case. Um, and suppose we examine the input to, to the GN uh, for node V1 and the input uh, for node V6. Uh, we find that the input are exactly the same because um, the uh, like embedding is over like a small subgraph with two nodes and one node has a white uh, as the like a node feature. Another node has a gray box as the original feature. And this is the same for node V6, right? Because it has exactly the same neighborhood structure. So suppose we want to encode these two nodes using graph neural network, then what we found is that the embedding for node V1 and V6 are identical, and therefore we'll make the same prediction for these two nodes. Um, however, remember that uh, in this prediction task, we label the nodes differently. So on the one hand, we label node V1 as red. Uh, on the other hand, we label the uh, node V6 as blue. So this kind of uh, constructs like a, a contradictory prediction for uh, the ground truth label and kind of uh, demonstrate why it could be a problematic uh, like a solution. Suppose we use GN for uh, this type of task. So this is really like a, a problem uh, we have encountered. Uh, and this is uh, because the features of the nodes are no longer very predictive for a task that we care about. So suppose we simply um, aggregate based on the node's neighborhood structure, we are still not able to like, uh, make predictions uh, for this particular task. Um, in comparison, suppose we just run label propagation, um, which ignores node label, uh, uh, sorry, ignores node feature, um, it will still perform much better than GN. Um, for example, um, given the same network, uh, we remove the label of node V1 and node V6, and we will propagate the uh, label using the remaining nodes. Then in the end, we will find that uh, label propagation will assign very high likelihoods for node V1 of being red, and then we'll have very high likelihood for node V6 um, labeling as uh, blue. So label propagation, although being simple, will kind of fix this failure mode for a graph neural network. So uh, let's formally introduce, uh, based on this motivation, let's formally introduce uh, correct and smooth uh, as approach to bridge the gap of graph neural network and then and label propagation. Um, so our setting um, is the same as we have seen. So we have a network, some of them are labeled, some of the nodes are not labeled, and then we have uh, a lot of feature vec vectors that are associated with each of the nodes. And correct and smooth uh, have a three-step procedure uh, to make predictions on this uh, semi super learning setting. Um, the first step is to train a base predictor, and we, can later, we will later visit the options of the base predictor. It can be as simple as a multi-layer perceptron that only make predictions for each of the nodes, uh, or it can be like a fully functional graph neural network. Uh, and then given the base predictor, uh, we're going to predict a soft labels for all of the nodes. But of course, this prediction is not perfect uh, based on the limitations that we have just discussed. So in the final step, correct and smooth, we'll post-process the predictions based on the graph structure uh, we have. And this way, we can obtain the final prediction for all of the nodes uh, by like, uh, correcting and smoothing the prediction. 
So this is the overall like algorithm outline for uh, CNS. So the first step is to define a base pre uh, predictor um, that can uh, make the first round predictions based on the attributes of the node, and then we can get a soft prediction for a given node. Uh, like a, for example, the most simple case can be uh, a linear model or multi-layer perceptron, uh, just built over the node features. Um, and of course, we can also use a graph neural network to be such a base predictor. Um, so in our case, the, what the base model will do is that we will consume this network as the input, and then we will generate a soft label for each of the nodes. The reason it is soft is because uh, we are like making a prediction using a neural network, so, and the predictions um, that will be the models like a like a like gas on the label of a given node. So uh, in most cases, it will be a soft a predi a predictive vector. So this is the first step. That is, we want to set up a base model and then generate the like the first uh, intuition um, of a given node. And then um, given the trained uh, base predictor, we'll then uh, obtain the soft label for uh, all the existing nodes in the network. Um, so in the idea that, that kind of uh, distinguish um, correct and smooth and label propagation is that we want to generate prediction for all of the nodes in the network. Um, for label prediction, we only generate the like a likelihood for the unknown nodes. Uh, but for uh, crack and smooth, we really want to generate the prediction for all of the nodes. Um, and the reason we will talk about it later, that is what we want to um, leverage the difference between our prediction and the ground truth to compute the arrow, and we want to propagate the arrow across the network. Um, and after getting this soft predictions for each of the nodes in the network, um, our motivation is that can we leverage the graph structure and based on the assumption of homophily, to fine tune those predictions and making them like a more accurate and more realistic. So next come to the uh, central part of correct and smooth, uh, which consists of first uh, correcting the prediction and then smoothing the prediction. Um, so these are the post-processing step we want to make. Suppose we have got like the first round prediction from a base predictor. So the first step is the uh, correct uh, stage, uh, where uh, we want to correct the predictions um, made from these base predictors um, based on the uh, graph neighborhood structure. Um, and what we'll do is to compute the arrow of, for like, the nodes that we have the label, and we want to uh, propagate such arrows um, through the network. And we'll talk about it in more detail later. Um, and the idea of the smooth step is then um, we will smooth the predictions across the network. Um, and essentially this uh, smooth step is uh, very similar to we see uh, for label propagation. Uh, it's just a, like a, a slightly, uh, like a, it, it only have some slight variant in the exact formulation. But the basic idea is the same as label propagation. So we will uh, introduce the concrete step of how to correct the prediction, and then how to smooth the prediction. Um, so uh, first step is uh, the correct step. And our key idea is that we want to expect the arrow in the base prediction to be possibly correlated across the network. Um, so we kind of slightly uh, change the assumption of homophily. So remember, in homophily, we assume that um, the label of a given node well, it's highly correlated uh, based on the network structure. Um, and here the assumption is that the arrows that are made through a neural network uh, also have this homophily structure, so the arrows are highly correlated. Um, and based on this assumption, uh, we can uh, get the like a conclusion that uh, suppose a node, uh, like, like the arrow of a node increases uh, like a, uh, at a certain, like a, sorry, given a certain node, uh, suppose its arrow is huge, we want to uh, argue that uh, such arrow will similarly appear in its neighbors. And um, based on this uh, conclusion we find, uh, the exact algorithm is that we want to spread such uncertainty or spread those arrows uh, across the network to update our prediction. 
Um, here is a concrete example of the uh, correct and uh, correct stage. So um, as we said, we will uh, get the prediction vector for each of the nodes in the network, and that includes the labeled nodes. And because we know the ground truth label for certain nodes, we'll be able to compute the arrow that we make for um, those labeled nodes. Um, for example, for this green node seven, uh, we know that the ground truth label should be one zero, uh, meaning that it's labeled as uh, green. And we have the predictions from the base predictor, uh, and the prediction was uh, 0 0.95 and 0 0.05. And based on the ground truth and the prediction, we'll be able to compute the arrow. So that describes um, the arrow the base model has made on this particular node. Um, and similarly, we can compute the arrow for all the remaining label nodes in the network. Um, and then for the remaining unlabeled nodes, because we never know the ground truth, so we wouldn't be able to compute the arrow. After this uh, stage, we'll now characterize um, the, lab the arrows that we have made on this network. Um, and then uh, we'll uh, update the arrow along the edges or along the graph structure uh, that we have seen. And this is based on our motivation uh, talked about earlier. That is, uh, the arrow follow uh, the homophily structure uh, on the network. And, and in particular, we will diffuse the arrow along the edges using this uh, diffusion matrix um, A uh, uh, tilde uh, that is defined uh, in the next uh, slide. So um, in particular, the update algorithm uh, can be written as this. So we have the arrow vector for each of the nodes in the network. Um, we will like uh, sum the arrow with the propagated arrow uh, with certain hyperparameter that, that kind of do a weighted sum. So um, after computing the arrow messages and then computing the propagated arrow message and sum them up, we can get the next step arrow for time t plus one. And then we'll repeat this process iteratively um, until it converge. So this is uh, very similar to label propagation, um, and also similar to the page rank algorithm. Um, so what is this uh, normalized adjacency matrix? Um, we will define the, uh, this normalized adjacency matrix as um, the diagonal matrix of the node degree um, power to the uh, negative uh, 0 0.5, and then um, times adjacency matrix and then times this diagonal uh, node degree matrix. And uh, why this formulation uh, is desirable, we'll talk about in the next slide. Um, and in practice, we also need to add a self loop to this adjacency matrix um, so that we can uh, keep or retain the information um, for a given node. Um, and this D uh, is kind of a, the degree a matrix, which is a diagonal matrix, tells about um, the specific degree for each of the nodes in the network. Um, so this setting is uh, pr first proposed in um, this paper in 2013. So why do we want to have this uh, exact formulation for the diffusion matrix? Um, so this is uh, based on the fact that um, the uh, eigenvalue of uh, this matrix are always in the range of negative one to one. Um, and in particular, we can find that uh, the eigenvector um, uh, of this uh, like a normalized uh, diffusion matrix uh, is uh, d1 over 2 times 1, and then the corresponding eigenvalue is 1. Um, the reason for that uh, like a finding uh, can be proved as follows. So we manually um, multiply the uh, normalized diffusion matrix uh, with this um, uh, eigenvector, and we can uh, like a reason that in the end the uh, computer result uh, is identical to one times um, this eigenvector. So that kind of conclude first uh, this uh, d one over two times one is a uh, like a, a eigenvector of this matrix, and second uh, the eigenvalue is one. 
Um, and this derivation utilizes the finding that um, suppose we uh, like multiply the adjacency matrix with a O1 vector, and then um, it is equal to uh, like multiply the diagonal degree matrix uh, with the O1 vector because uh, by computing with both approaches, we can get the node degree vector. So using this property, we'll be able to show that the largest um, eigenvalue of this matrix is actually one, and we can also find the eigenvector. Uh, so why this finding is important? This is because with this, uh, this uh, derivation, we can see that uh, this normalized matrix is well behaved. Uh, like uh, suppose we power the matrix for any uh, k iteration, um, because um, even we power it to the k iteration, the eigenvalues are still uh, like a controlled within the range of negative one to one. Um, and then uh, the largest eigenvalue uh, is always one. Um, and with this nice property, um, suppose we uh, like a iteratively apply this uh, like a normalized adjacency or diffusion matrix um, to a vector in a given network, um, the output is always normalized. So we wouldn't get like an exploded value of uh, like a suppose uh, we repeatedly propagate the arrow on the network. So uh, in summary, this like a uh, slide tells us uh, like a why we want to use this normalized diffusion matrix to propagate arrows in the network. Um, and there's also like an intuitive uh, understanding that why this formulation makes sense. Um, so suppose we look at uh, the specific values of this normalized um, adjacency matrix. Uh, it is really like a one over the square root of di and square root uh, dj. Um, and uh, the intuitive to, way to understand this property is that um, suppose there are two nodes that are connected and they have like a very few neighbors of each other, then um, this value of aij uh, is pretty large. Um, and in this particular case, the value is one because uh, each node has a degree of one. And suppose um, these two nodes are connected, but then each of them has a lot of other neighbors. Uh, and in that case, uh, the value of uh, aij is small um, because uh, the d degree of uh, each of the nodes i and j is pretty large. So this is a kind of intuition to understand uh, like, uh, what is the effect after this normalization. So uh, ha having defined this uh, propagation matrix uh, A, we'll be able to um, diffuse uh, the training arrow across the network. So um, using the concrete example we have uh, derived here, we will start with computed uh, arrow uh, from the base predictor and the ground truth. And then we will propagate such arrow across the network. Um, in this case, we propagate for three iterations. Um, and then you can see the other uh, like uh, arrow vectors are now updated. And we can find that, um, that some regions of the network uh, have a, a less erroneous part. So in this case, um, the arrows are smaller for these nodes. Um, and for some remaining part of the uh, graph, like, uh, uh, like uh, there are, the arrow are larger, so it, they are more erroneous. So like, this is kind of the converged result. Suppose you apply this arrow diffusion for multiple steps. Um, and in the end, uh, like a, the, the way we utilize this diffuse training arrow is that we'll start uh, uh, like a summing up our soft predictions and the diffuse training arrows. So uh, remember the soft labels are obtained through the base predictor, uh, either like a multilayer perceptron or a GN. Um, and then uh, we'll sum the soft prediction with the diffuse training arrow. And this will be uh, like leading to the uh, final predictions um, after this correct stage. Um, and there is like a uh, like a hyperparameter s that uh, scale the prediction uh, uh, scale the arrow um, of the uh, diffused arrows. So this like kind of uh, finish the first step of the correct and smooth, where we have the soft prediction and then the diffused training arrow. Um, 
question? To train the face to get um, No, it is fully like a post processing stage in the sense that um, the model is always trained directly with the labels, uh, but then this like a uh, update on the predictions is a fully post processing stage. Um, question? Is it possible to apply this procedure when you are running inference on a different graph than you've trained on? So you don't have access to any ground truth information for the, the new graph. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I think it, it is like not possible uh, based on the original like a uh, algorithm here, yeah. because uh, it is really like a propagating the arrow. So suppose we do not have ground truth, then um, like uh, we couldn't propagate arrow. So that's why in the beginning of this lecture, we talk about we focus on this uh, transductive learning setting, where we only have one network. But uh, I think uh, you raised like a good point in the sense that uh, we could instead of using this arrow propagation, we can revert to like a, some smooth version of your base predictor. For example, you can propagate your um, prediction uh, scores for different nodes. Um, and you can still smooth your prediction. Uh, and that does not rely on the ground truth um, as an alternative over there. I have another question about that then. Wouldn't it be a, a, a natural idea to take algorithm two, but also include the labels or predicted labels in the messages that you're passing? So then you've solved the problem that the labels are not in the messages, and also you can apply it in the inductive setting. I mean, why, not, why not just do that instead of all of this? So uh, you're suggesting combining the labels in the G and message passing. Yeah, uh, I think one uh, motivation of this approach is that this kind of fully model agnostic in the sense that you can choose any base predictor uh, like to make the first round prediction and then uh, like update the prediction. So this is also kind of another reason why this approach is very popular because you can always make prediction with any of your favorite model and in the end you update the prediction with this simple approach. Um, but I think what you suggest is definitely another good idea, uh, like a, how to directly leverage the label in message passing. And we can, uh, we'll visit like a simpler version in the final of this lecture. We'll talk about this uh, mask label prediction. I think uh, kind, of, kind of similar to what we proposed. Um, another question? Alpha is controlling. Yeah, so uh, this scale of S controls like uh, how important we think uh, the homophily exists in a given network. Uh, let's say we set uh, S to be very small or even to zero, then basically we said we do not believe that there's any homophily in the network structure. Uh, and on the contrary, suppose we set X to be larger than uh, it kind of, we want to emphasize that the homophily assumption holds in the network and we want to uh, correct uh, uh, the prediction even further. Yeah. Um, question? If let's say my problem is a graph classification problem, mm -hmm. can I still use like masks to basically make this happen and improve my performance? So basically improve upon the node features that I had initially for the graph classification problem? Um, I think for graph classification, um, you wouldn't be able to directly use it uh, for the same reason because um, for graph classification, you always apply to a new graph. And for that uh, new or an unknown graph, you do not have the ground truth. So you couldn't directly use this like a uh, like an arrow propagation for graph classification. In order to improve my predictions, like during training, I mean, let's say if I don't trust my features, I think that there are some errors in the features that I put in the, in the initial, into, into the nodes for the graphs that I'm using to train it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think uh, you can like, uh, kind of uh, diffuse uh, or like, uh, update your features of your network, uh, but still like, uh, it's slightly different from this uh, correct and smooth paradigm, but it's more similar to the label propagation idea. So uh, instead of propagating labels, you could propagate features in your network to improve the features. So, um, so similar ideas, but like a slightly different from what we discussed here. Okay, so now we have seen the first part of the algorithm, how to correct the prediction based on the arrows made by the model uh, and ba based on the network structure. Um, the next stage of this uh, CNS uh, is smooth operator. Um, so 
this stage is actually uh, identical to we, what we introduced about labor progression. Um, the, um, uh, the assumption here is that uh, the neighboring nodes tend to share the similar uh, labels. Um, so um, in, in this case, uh, for the training nodes, we'll use the ground truth hard labels instead of the soft labels. So this is exactly what we see in the label progression, uh, right? So um, instead of like updating the node, we have the labels, we will just always enforce them to be the ground truth label, like a one zero or zero one. And then for all the remaining unseen or unknown labels, uh, unknown nodes, we will use what we have seen um, like a, in the first correct stage. Um, so, th so this way we can initiate the smooth step uh, for the, uh, the algorithm. Um, and then the exact way of the smoothing um, is uh, identical to what we see for the, uh, like uh, in the um, labor propagation, uh, except that we have this like a uh, hyperparameter that smooths, um, like control, uh, like uh, how, how, how strong the smoothing factor is. Um, so um, what we do here is to uh, diffuse the label across edges um, and update uh, by setting the like a new predictive uh, predictive vector for a given node as the average of its neighbors. Um, so this is how to interpret this a times d, um, and then we'll do a weighted sum between the uh, diffuse predictions uh, and the original predictions, uh, and the weight the weight of this weighted sum uh, is also controlled by a hyperparameter, and this hyperparameter basically tells. Um, like how strong we believe that the labels should be correlated. So um, after the smoothing, um, you can like take the uh, output of the correct stage as the input, and then perform smoothing for a few iterations. And let's say we do three step iteration and set the smoothing vector to be 0.8. Um, and one note we want to make here is that you can find the final prediction scores are not a rigorous uh, probability vector. So you find that, that a lot of them, they do not sum to one, um, like after this update stage. Um, so in the end, uh, because we just care about making predictions, uh, we will just uh, pick the class with the maximum score. Um, so what I mean that, for example, this uh, point 74 and point 18, they do not sum to one, but because we know that the first class has a higher predictive score, then uh, the model will output class one um, for uh, this, a uh, class zero for this uh, given prediction. So um, the, the, because the, arg uh, the algorithm does not uh, enforce a normalized uh, probability vector, uh, we will just pick uh, whichever class has a higher predictive score. Um, so uh, to, to summarize, uh, we have uh, start the correct and smooth with a base predictor. Um, and then after correct and smooth, uh, we, we get a prediction uh, uh, like, a, like this. And we find that the uh, algorithm is able to correct uh, a lot of mistakes uh, made by the base uh, predictor. Um, and it, it is kind of very successfully correct those uh, like, uh, issues. For example, um, some of nodes uh, eight and uh, node three, uh, they are misclassified. Suppose we only use the base model, uh, but after the cr uh, cracks uh, and smooth stage, um, node eight is now correctly labeled as green, and node three is correctly labeled as red. Um, so this demonstrates like a, a why this method um, is able to correct the mistakes made uh, with a base predictor. Um, so in practice, uh, this approach uh, works extremely well. Um, it can even uh, predict, uh, like uh, update the prediction with a very simple base predictor, uh, like a multi-layer perceptron. Um, so for example, um, so consider this uh, node classification task. Um, so it's called uh, OGB products dataset. Um, with the base model, uh, you only achieve accuracy of uh, 63, which is pretty low. Um, so suppose we do MLP plus the smooth stage only, uh, we can get a performance of 80%. Uh, 
and with the full crack and smooth approach, uh, we get like 84% accuracy, and this is almost already on par with the um, set of our performance. So uh, this uh, result demonstrates like even with a simple or naive prediction model MLP, uh, after the process processing of its predictions, uh, the model performance can be greatly boosted. Um, to summarize, um, the idea of correct and smooth is to uh, use uh, the graph structure and the homophily assumption to update the prediction uh, or post-process the prediction. Um, and in the correct uh, step, we make the assumption that uh, the arrows follows the homophily assumption. So uh, we can diffuse and uh, correct the arrows um, that are made uh, from the base picture. Uh, and in the smooth step, uh, we'll have the assumption of the labels follows the homophily assumption. Uh, and in this case, we will just smoothen the prediction of the, the base prediction. Um, and this is uh, a variant of the label propagation algorithm we have seen earlier. Um, and the strengths of this two step are controlled by two hyperparameters uh, based on how, uh, how, how, how uh, important you think homophily is for uh, each of the stage. Um, and uh, in practice, this uh, correct and smooth is really uh, model agnostic because uh, it can be combined with any base picture. So people have used it uh, in combination with graph neural networks uh, quite often as well. Um, and uh, we have shown a concrete example that correct and smooth can really achieve very strong performance on this uh, semi surprise uh, node classification problem. So it's uh, worth considering. Suppose you want to uh, like implement your own GM pipeline uh, in practice. So, so far we have talked about um, the idea of label propagation and then a very successful uh, algorithm called correct and smooth. Um, in the final part of this lecture, we're going to visit uh, a slightly different but similar idea called mass label propagation. And this approach is uh, significantly easier to implement and uh, also very successful. Um, so uh, here uh, is the idea of mask level prediction. Um, so still our main motivation here is to explicitly consider label, uh, label information uh, in the network when we make machine learning predictions. And this approach is actually inspired from the BERT uh, objective uh, that are widely used in natural language processing. Um, so the idea of this uh, BERT uh, objective um, is uh, a pair treating strategy where we want to uh, make a uh, mask uh, word prediction. Um, so more concretely, given an input, uh, which is a sequence um, of different words um, in, in this uh, transformer uh, training stage, uh, what we will do is that we will randomly mask um, some of the uh, like a, a input tokens of this sequence of words, uh, and then we will let the model to predict um, those values um, like a, uh, to train the network. So um, in the end, what we'll have is to have partially observed sequence and then predict the remaining uh, values in the sequence. So this is the motivation of this uh, mask label prediction. So um, in, in, uh, concretely, we'll uh, apply the similar approach to uh, graph, uh, graph uh, sorry, for node level classification as well. Um, so the idea is that um, instead of treating labels as like uh, some additional uh, attached uh, value to a given node, we will treat the label directly as features. Um, but of course, we want to like, uh, make sure that the model is not cheating, so it's not like using the label to predicting the label itself. Um, so what we will do is to uh, construct a machine learning setting that we use partially observed labels to predict the remaining unobserved um, feature labels. Um, so what it means is that in the training stage, uh, we will corrupt the uh, node label matrix Y by uh, randomly masking a portion of the node labels to zeros. Um, and then we will tr treat the remaining uh, uh, like a node labels as additional features uh, of the node. So what we will do is we will just uh, concatenate the node features 
uh, with the mask, not the labels. So we treat labels as features. And, and uh, after defining this new node features, we'll use this new node feature to predict uh, the mask, not the labels. So you can see that uh, under this formulation, the model is not cheating, although it is kind of explicitly using the labels of different nodes. Uh, we are making sure that we always use some of the node labels to predict the remaining node labels. So this way, like there's no uh, direct leakage uh, of uh, the node labels. And this is how we do at the training time. And suppose the model is able to do that like uh, successfully in the training time, then uh, at inference time, we'll employ all the uh, observed node labels uh, to predict the remaining unobserved node label. Um, so this is what we do for both uh, validation and test set uh, in the sense that we'll directly concatenate uh, like the feature X uh, with the node label Y uh, as the updated node feature. And then we'll use that combined node feature and labels to predict any remaining labels in the data set. And you can find that this approach uh, of setting up the training and inference uh, splits uh, is very similar to what we have seen in the link prediction. And uh, is for good reason because both approach uh, can be regarded as a special type of self-supervised learning on a network. So in this case, uh, we are constructing um, the uh, like objective based on um, what we have in the network. So we will make sure that we will use part of the input as the uh, input uh, of the training and a remaining part of the like a uh, input as the supervision. So in link prediction, um, like a, for certain edges, we'll reserve some of the edges for message passing and then using the remaining edges uh, as the supervision. And here similarly, we reserve some of the labels as the input for, for the network and then use the remaining of the labels as the uh, supervision signals. So that's why this uh, algorithm looks similar. Um, so, so here this concludes the idea of mask label prediction and you can see that is uh, like a pretty simple and straightforward. You are not like a changing any of your machine learning pipeline uh, except that you set up the uh, features and the label of the network slightly different and it can be used for like uh, any uh, pipeline architecture uh, we have defined. Um, question? Can you uh, connect this third method to label propagation? Can you explain how, how this setup is propagating the labels? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're we'll fine. So this, uh, our, this uh, setting is like a, not like a directly related to what I was saying earlier. So in the previous approach of label propagation and crack and smooth, we explicit propagate the label information in the network through like a, uh, like a, a closed form algorithm. Um, in this case, uh, the model is like implicitly uh, propagating the label information across the network. Um, so this really depends on what uh, like a model you choose here. Um, let's say we still use graph neural network um, uh, for this mask label prediction task. Then in that sense, uh, we are still making propagation because you know uh, GNN is making uh, message passing or propagation uh, for uh, from uh, certain node features to the remaining node features, and because um, we treat labels as one special node feature, so with GNN message passing, uh, we are kind of uh, also passing the label uh, label information across the network. But this is kind of related to what model you choose here. So suppose you are not using GN using MLP, then it wouldn't have this uh, like a nice property of propagation. Um, so, um, so this is kind of one way to understand this algorithm. Um, another question? Can you explain throughout the context how is mass label prediction transductive? Uh -huh. So uh, the question is uh, why this approach is transactive? Um, so, so, so honestly, for this approach, um, it definitely works for a transactive setting, but it also works for inductive setting. Um, so the reason is um, the setup here, uh, we do not use any like a, a information particular to a network, right? So uh, we're training a model um, using some of the uh, observed uh, labels and then all the features to predict 
the unobserved labels. So this approach can be generalized for a new, uh, like a, a new graph, because for a new graph, suppose we know some of the labels, then we can still concatenate the feature and the labels to predict all, uh, the remaining labels. So uh, this approach can, kind of can generalize um, like to unseen graph as well. Um, and suppose uh, you are asking about transactive setting, uh, the approach also works because for a given network, suppose you train on one special split of the like a, the feature and then the label, then you can still predict for the remaining unobserved labels. Um, so um, we can conclude what we have learned in this lecture. Um, so we talk about three different approaches, uh, but really the uh, key thing you can, the key takeaway from the lecture is that uh, we have introduced some approach that can explicitly learn the label information in the network. Um, so remember like uh, earlier we focused on graph neural network and it's really about how to learn the structure and the feature. So we didn't explicitly utilize label in those algorithms. But what we learned today is uh, three different options that can explicitly take label information into consideration. And this approach includes uh, the basic version of label propagation that we propagate labels across the network. And it has a more advanced formulation where we combine a base predictor and label propagation um, to smooth and correct uh, the prediction. Uh, and we also see another way of mask label prediction that uh, directly construct a machine learning task to uh, let the model in incorporate the uh, label information. Um, and then, uh, like a, in a higher level, we have concluded our discussion on machine learning with graphs. And we have talked about three main paradigms regarding machine learning on graphs, including the node embedding based methods, GNN and label propagation. So for node embedding methods, it does not use any node attributes. It, based on the assumption of uh, we can train uh, embeddings based on the uh, suppose nodes, uh, nodes are following this uh, like a short random walks and we construct positive uh, node pairs, suppose they locate in the same random walk, uh, like a, uh, if they co-occur in the same short random walk, and then um, if not, it's kind of a negative example. So uh, the idea of node embedding is like agnostic to the downstream task, it's like a one way to construct the self software learning setting. The GN is more principled in the sense that it learns an iterative neighborhood aggregation uh, function that uh, can process uh, the network structure as well as the uh, uh, network attributes. Um, and finally, today we introduced the label progression idea, uh, which has an inductive piles of assuming the network follows a homophily uh, property, and then it can explicitly incorporate the label information uh, when uh, like uh, making predictions. So these three paradigms uh, have all have like a very wide application in reality. And uh, to solve a specific graph machine learning problem, you can either choose like one of the paradigm here, or uh, like what we uh, discussed today, uh, you can combine this different approach, uh, for example, in crack and smooth, uh, it kind of combines graph neural network and label propagation. Um, so with that, uh, I'm going to conclude this lecture. Uh, thank you very much.